Well, here we are then. A warm welcome back to the comfort of Wind Your Neck In for season two. Can't believe how fast season one went, but here we are. Thank you for starting the journey again with us. And we are delighted to be joined by you through this journey of high performance, real life stories, and a bit of banter with some amazing guests lined up. Before we get started, there are a few thank yous, which I, I was a bit slack on getting out through season one. So firstly, You will have noticed before every episode, there's an amazing jingle that goes on. And the man to thank for that is the human cow head himself, Ethan Waller. So I just want to say a quick thank you to Ethan for putting that together and making the intro and outro to the episodes so magical and special. Thank you, Beef. Secondly, if you're following us on on any sort of social media platform, you'll realize halfway through season one, we jazzed up our social media. And that's the that, that's solely down to the work that Ryan Mills did in creating and organizing templates, banner heads, um, to make us look, well, considerably more professional than we are. So thank you to Millsy for that. We appreciate all the effort that it took to put those together. And thank you very much, mate. And finally, to ASM Management, my representative company, um, opening doors and creating connections with some of massive names in the world of sports. So thank you for helping me develop away from rugby and giving me those introductions to some amazing people within sports. So as we move on to the first episode of Wind Your Neck In, we are firstly live. We're going we're gonna to produce this content and put it on YouTube. And secondly, it's going to go out on all podcasting platforms. So if you're having the pleasure of watching us on YouTube, you'll notice that the good man who's joined us today is, well, he's sporting quite a head of hair. And if you aren't watching on YouTube, it's Duncan Weir. So welcome, Donkey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Not a problem at all. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Donkey, you're obviously deep, deep, deep in the midst of, of camp with Scotland. And, and I suppose, first of all, it, we just need to ask how everything's going in there. It's been a pretty, um, pretty intense couple of weeks as you've been preparing for games. And then you've obviously played a couple now. How's everything going in camp? Yeah, it's been good. Um, obviously, it's, um, it's strange times just now under the circumstances. And um, we're keeping our bubble as tight as we can with, with people just staying in the, the hotel for... Um, well, this stretch is going to be four weeks uh, solely in the hotel. Um, we're up at the the Orium, uh, is where we're based, just outside of Edinburgh. So um, it's right beside Heriot Watt University. So there's not a great deal uh, going on. There's a nice 5k walk you can do, but the to be fair, not many um, front rowers doing that either. <laughs> no, it's it's actually pretty nice. Um, my sister came up with the the dogs. Uh, she's been looking after the dogs, so we went and done that the other week, and it was it was really nice. But um, just the, at the start of last week, there they've got a golf simulator built up. Ooh! Um, so boys You're have been playing some the old pins. course. Yeah, boys have been setting course records at the old <laughs> course, uh, and it's like they've got like you can set your distance of gimme putts because I don't think the putting's that accurate or whatever. So that's about boys 14 have been feet smashing for me, I think. Records. <laughs> yeah, so boys have been smart. If it's on the green, it's a gimme. So uh, <laughs> no, boys have been loving that. Um, uh, Who are the yeah, good golfers, no, so, Dunk? Um, Apart from your good self, obviously we before my well, yeah, enjoyed a round obviously. around Port Rush, which was you know three weeks later. It was the 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 open course, so we enjoyed that. I dug some holes and you attacked some pins. Yeah, um, Stuart McAnally's good. He's just got. Uh, a set of these fancy tailor maids that are all just custom built for himself. So um, he thinks he's a golfer, that's for sure. Um, to be fair, I've not really been over that often. Um, I've, I've just been uh, tailoring my, 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 going back to the apartment to support Nicola and the kids, um, which is, uh, she's sadly in the trenches, but on a, <laughs> a war in both fronts at the minute. But um, yeah, absolutely. no, it's... Um, it's been uh, it's been good in camp. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's always nice um, for for me personally, just because I obviously I'm down in Worcester now, so I don't get the chance to catch up with guys as easy as um, it once was before when I was based in Glasgow or Edinburgh. So it's uh, it's really nice to catch up with the guys. Absolutely, I think um, you know one of the things I was keen to discuss was obviously this your bromance with Stuart Hogg's quite well publicised. You've known each other for years and years and years. But is there apart from from Hoggy, I should call him Stuart. I don't know him, but apart from Hoggy, is there anyone in camp who you have enjoyed being able to reconnect with? Obviously, you see Koba every day, Cornell every day. Mm-hmm. But those guys that you played with, because you played for both Scottish teams, um, you know, and we will get to to that. Who are the guys that you've really enjoyed reconnecting with? Um. A lot of boys, to be fair. Oh, obviously, you know Rambo, so 
Yeah. I'd speak to Rambo probably. Um, Stuart McNally for month. anyone who, who doesn't know him as yeah. Rambo. So yeah, I'd speak to him every month or so on text, just ping him a, a message, see how he's doing. But it's probably the guys that you you have these strong relationships with, but you're just so busy like day to day. I'm hopeless keeping up with folk at times. Um, I know. I, I know. live three, um, I live three to five miles away from you, and getting a reply <laughs> on WhatsApp's a challenge. Um, but that's the part of the carnage of having uh, kids and all the rest of it. Like your priorities are just. Um, flipped on its head and you need to go and tile them out so they can they can sleep <laughs> um but yeah and also for me sean maitland uh obviously spending a lot of time with him at glasgow Dunky taylor's just came in a camp last week and he is yeah. just one of the best guys uh within rugby um yeah just to name a few um yeah i'm sure there's i, I get on with um as you know i'm, I'm quite a jolly character so there's not many people <laughs> well at times, I'm a jolly, jolly character. I can have my moans when I want, but um, yeah, no, it's just nice to catch up with folk, and yeah, it's it's um, it's a special special time, and I cherish it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get into the into the depths of of getting back into the Scotland camp, but I mean, firstly, I think it's been all over social media, and anyone watching on YouTube here will see that you're sporting quite a head of hair, and I think it's important that we get to this sooner rather than later because you're not just doing it for the crack there's a real the elephant in the room the elephant in the room <laughs> is, atta- is attached to your skull um and i think the work you're doing i'm going to let you explain it now but it's amazing so can you just tell everybody what the cause is and we're going to get all the the posts and pages that we need to get out there to hopefully get some more money on board yeah um so i think it was probably the beginning to middle of lockdown and uh, obviously all the barbers closed and people are doing their own DIY haircuts and all the rest of it and and I just came up with an idea thing oh well I may as well just let it grow for, in, until the rest of the year and see if I can raise some money for charity um, obviously being a professional sportsman you've got that that window of, of um, that TV um, window that people are going to watch you um, and you, you've got that profile that Hopefully you can get a bit of a uh, attention for that that chosen charity that you you choose. And um, I didn't know whether to do it, but to be fair, I, I can remember for the last say ten fifteen years, people have always said, "Just let your hair grow, like just see how it what it <laughs> turns into, and just see the madness that it creates uh, oh, on the top well, of your head." Right. And it's yeah, no, it's um, once you get past that niggly stage, like I'm I'm pretty. Apart from um, going to uh, town on head and shoulders every other night of the, uh, of the week, like I'm actually fine with it. It doesn't bother me anymore. Um, it's almost a second pillow in bed as well now. It's, it's at a great stage. Um, Is your neck not out? No, your neck. <laughs> <laughs> but no, sorry. Um, I remember speaking to you a fair bit about it as well. And um, uh, I was going to do it initially for the NHS, but you've seen all these 5Ks and all the rest of it. And I, and I just thought, maybe if I supported Acorn's uh, Kids Hospice um, we've got such a strong relationship uh, with the Warriors with them and um, being a, a, a new father myself um, it just kind of touched that soft spot in you uh, in your heart and yeah it was an easy decision to go along with them and uh, initially I, I remember sp- speaking to Mel and I was like, oh, what, 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 what will I set my target? Like, I don't really know. Like, what am I expecting here? And I thought I could do fairly well, but you, you, you just don't know how generous people are going to be. And um, I remember setting the target at two grand, and then say four weeks in, you're setting it at four grand, mm. and it's just domino effect. And uh, at the start of last week, I think I was sitting just bef- just below kind of five and a half grand uh, and we've, t- we've done this week and it's it's just shy of 12 grand yeah uh, and obviously just just being in the profile of, of playing international rugby is has, has been a great um uh helping factor uh to get to get it out there um but no uh, the uh, it's kind of blown me away the support and uh that i've had um albeit people are having a good chuckle at it which is which is great um i mean this this year has been tough for a lot of people and charities businesses um you name it have, have, have a, has had a tough year so i mean if they have a a, a chuckle every time you they see me on the screen and and, uh, and see the nick of me chucking, uh, run about the place then um i'm well up for it 
Um, and yeah, I, I, once it got past that niggly stage where it's it's not long, but it's not it's it's not short, and it's it's just um, it's just a bit itchy all the time. But yeah. no, no, it's it's lovely. I can't go any. I can't look any stronger. No, it is. It's an impressive. It's very, very impressive. And I, I kind of always thought it had the potential to go into full Afro mode, but it's, it's even, it's, it's exceeded my expectations. And I think, um, no, it's been brilliant, Duncan. I think as the, as the ambassador for Worcester Warriors connected to Acorns, like I can't thank you enough because, um, you know, as you've mentioned, there's, there's many different organizations, charities, um, struggling at the moment due to fundraising, which is where they make up, you know, 80 plus percent of their, of their funds for the year. Um, and, and you just having a bit of crack, um, at your own expense and trying to raise some money has just been unbelievable. So we're sitting just short of 12 grand. And I suppose the question is, if we can get you to 20, are you going to for another year? Oh, <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> I don't know. See, I, don't, I, really I, I honestly, um, I don't know what I'll, what I'll do come January. Like, uh, I don't think I'm going to shave it off. I'm definitely not going uh, these high and tight haircuts that you're cutting about. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll just um, get it a little bit managed and just keep a little bit of the, the fuzz yeah. in it. Um, yeah. But I, I think a big part of it was just um, when people have asked me, especially the boys from from up north of the border at Scotland camp, like what what is aircons? Like what what is it? And then I, I explain what they do and, and how they help families. Um and they're like, Oh my god, yeah, that's so worthwhile. Like it's it's not um yeah it's not a, a, a kind of soft um kind of uh what's a what's a word like just it's it's something that's really um powerful and um, what they do and how they can help people. So it's uh, it's not just a wee, um, albeit piss take charity that, that might yeah. be a friend of a friend and, oh yeah, I'll get donated type thing. It's yeah. it's going to a, a really strong cause and it's, yeah, um, yeah no, it's um, uh, me seeing the, the front hand, like how grateful they are um, to me and, I, and I'm not doing anything special. I'm just letting it grow. Like, yeah. I get a hairband and I can still do my job. I can still play rugby and it's not annoying. Yeah. Like it's yeah. it's not the biggest hassle on my behalf. Uh, so like it, it's just been so worthwhile uh, and and very um, rewarding just seeing that figure and, and how generous people have been. It's it's been class. Yeah, well, we're going to attach all the relevant pages um, to, to give people the opportunity to see and uh, donate if they feel. That they want to but i mean let, let's see if we can push that to, to 15 and then um we'll readdress it any any time after that don't give but i think it's amazing and, and we really appreciate it i suppose it's only relevant and um, this week that we if we're touching on acorns and the impact that it has particularly in the worcester community and uh, worcester shirt community and um, that we touch on obviously the sad news of cecil uh, duckworth passing away who we know um particularly well as the the original benefactor and 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 sole driver of what Worcester Warriors has become. Have you any thoughts on on that? Have you had a chance to to touch base with anyone back in Worcester about that? No, it's it's just just been a, a bit of a shock to the system. Um, I remember the first time I met him, uh, and I just thought he was an absolute gentleman. Uh, mm. What a guy! What a guy to the um, um, associated uh, with the club. Um, just how passionate he was, uh, and he actually um, he went out of his way to come and introduce himself, and he he wanted to know about me. He wanted to know about my my family. Um, if I was married, do I have kids? Like where we're living? Like he took a real interest on on me as a as a person, uh, albeit um, we all knew uh, Worcester was his uh, the Warriors was his his first love. He loved his rugby. He loved connecting with the guys, but. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a a real soft spot for him, um, and and just him taking the, the time out of his day. I always loved him rolling up in his Bentley and parking right yeah. outside the door. No <laughs> wonder, like the guy's a legend. The guy's done so much for the club. I'd, yeah. If that was me, I'd be doing the exact same parking Absolutely. right at the front door in that disabled space, and then and I wouldn't be moving for anyone if they tried to move me. Like. Um, um, no, nah, he just had such a great character about him, and um, yeah, it's it was real shocking news. But um, yeah, it's it's been amazing just seeing how many people that's reached out and and, and sent their, their, their messages to the family, and uh, it just shows you how good a, a guy and, and and what a gentleman he was. 
Yeah, absolutely. His legacy is unbelievable, Donkey. Not just with the Warriors, his legacy in the Worcester community, um, with things like Acorns, his relationship with the Worcestershire Cricket Club. Um, and just outside of that, I think you you hit the nail on the head there. He was very personable and, and very humble, um, but always spent time trying to get to know people who were involved in in the organizations that he was helping or or or, or um involved in. So our thoughts are with the Duckworth family no doubt about it and and um hopefully we can give him a proper send off this weekend and uh, in any way we can in relation to the the funeral that's coming in the next couple of days so uh, yeah th- thoughts with the duckworth family and i suppose donkey we've covered the hair we've covered the kind of um the 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 elephant in the skull as as you mentioned and i think it's probably only fair that we kind of give some context to the people um as to you know how we know each other really because mm-hmm. um we met many 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 moons ago and do you want to get the second elephant out of the room? Because, I mean, everybody needs to know circa 2010, 2011, um, whenever my Irish 20s team gave your Scottish 20s team an absolute spanking. Do we want to talk about that? Um, nah, what's the next topic? <laughs> no, but, I mean, I think I, it deserves... I it remember deserves... it well. I remember it well. It was... Um, Obviously, we are, we both know um, Lecky and Paddy Robinson. Um, yeah, good good guys um, that you went to school with, and you were really close. And then they came over and played club rugby in Glasgow uh, alongside me. So um, they uh, they gave me the old um, uh, touch on the shoulder, but oh, like, make sure you go and say hello to Niall and 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 he's a good lad. Trust me. And blah blah blah. Uh, and I remember. Was it the captain's launch for the twenties? Yeah. Horrific. Uh, and no one else was like speaking to each other, but me and you were just gabbing nonsense for the whole two hours long procedure. Um, that that would have been absolute torture if it wasn't for um, yeah. making a new pal. And yeah, no, it was. Um, uh, it's been from there. I've actually got your jersey still. Remember we swapped yeah. jerseys post match. Yeah, I've yeah, got that. Yeah, stuck I've it away in my yours. bag. Well, I asked you, and you said, "Oh, I don't know." <laughs> So don't, you know, don't I, I, you be coming on your podcast and saying, "Oh yeah, I've got it in my." my man, bag I've got it in Belfast. Second drawer up the stairs because it's, in, it's nonsense. In, it's in Belfast, mate. I can tell you exactly. It's in my my mum's house. It's in my mum's house, and it's in the wardrobe in the uh, in the spare room, guaranteed. It's a it's about it. Well, Gu- what is it? Guaranteed. Un, under under fourteen's boys or what? Well, just the the, the the last time I mentioned it to you. You were like, I think I've got it. And you were like scratching your head. And now I'm you're coming on your big fancy podcast <laughs> and you're telling me that it's in your mum's cupboard up the loft and all the rest. It's in my mum's cupboard, mate. It's in the mum's cupboard. The I'm viewers can you. see through you. The viewers can see through you. They can't see anything no. on a podcast, mate. <laughs> no, no, it, um, it is. It's very, I cherish no, that. It's, it's very important to have that. I enjoy the whole swapping jerseys and I haven't done it enough throughout my career. It's one of my main regrets. I have about... Uh, 10 Worcester jerseys that sit um, some of them are really special and some of them are just season, seasonal jerseys and I wish I would I would have done that more yeah no it was um, it's, a, it's a funny old thing that who would have thought what was that 10 10 11 years ago yeah uh, and we'd be sitting here chatting on a podcast um, <sighs> and, and we'd still be talking about these memories and um, no, we're we're um, I'm very grateful that we've we've got the past memories that make our relationship strong and and That's all it. the rest of it. That's it, Donkey. So I suppose you know I remember playing against you at that age, and and like even then I remember there being quite a bit of um, media attention about you being earmarked as a future future international, and like it was only you know. It was two years later, I think, that you made your Scotland A cap, and the year after that, that you made your um, your full Scottish cap. But the year after we played twenties, you know, in that two thousand and ten year, it could even have been the same year. You'd actually already started playing for Glasgow, which was like, you know, at at twenties level, um, as an out half, it's quite a big deal. Like you were earmarked very early as someone who was going to go, you know, into the into the the professional game as a full time professional at club rugby and an international. Do you remember? Um, the pressure that you felt at that age, or was it just pure excitement? Um, probably at that stage, I was just trying to soak it up. Like, like you say, um, I got I done my ACL medial and something else in my knee when I was um, seventeen, um, yep. and that was like, or was I sixteen? Uh, no, I was seventeen. Seventeen. And, um, yeah. And like that was like my first opportunity to really have a good go at uh, senior rugby, and that 
that just knocked me out. It was a season uh, I'd done it playing for the Scottish uh, Academy side at the Selkirk Sevens. Um, the week before the season started, so I'd done a whole summer. And um, to be honest, I have no idea. Like, I was getting like two trains on crutches to get physio. Yeah. Like, imagine, imagine telling that to some of the boys now. Like, they'd be like, "What? Uh, where's then, my like, valet? Where's my chauffeur?" <laughs> yeah, and it was like through Glasgow City Centre. I was going, so it was up and down like uh, Central <laughs> Station. Like, but at the time, you're just like, I was like something comes over you and you're just so driven to mm. to get back fit and, and play rugby. Um, and I made a quite a, I got a wee bit of grief, to be fair, off my, my club, Canvas Lang. So um, I'd only played, like, when I first t- turned 16, I played, like, maybe five games for the senior side before that injury, before the, the following season. Mm. And um, I, I was really grateful. I had a, a great academy uh, manager in my region called Jamie Dempsey, who was just going to Hawks and he was itching for me to go along to Hawks and um, the 20s coach um, at the time Peter Wright was a head coach there as well so they, they those guys and, and I had West of Scotland who were John Beatty um, Johnny Beatty's dad yeah um, he was coaching them and he was saying oh come up to us and all the rest of it and it was a it was pretty big rivalry at the time Hawks and West um, and I had this I had played no rugby and I and I and I just went. They had the Hawks had literally they they had the the, the on form Scotland under twenties ten in their camp. And he had a small injury when I was um uh, during that summer. And they were I made the decision. I was like, I'm just going to jump two footed and just go and give this a crack. And they yeah. And I was playing in like the Premiership uh, within Scotland, so it was a top flight of club rugby. Uh, and I managed to to get in there and 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 get a run of games and yeah I loved it I had a uh, a great season I made a lot of friends um, obviously Paddy and Lecky and that being in them uh, in that environment as well and uh, I was really fortunate at a young age that um, the opportunity came up at Glasgow and and Sean really believed in me of of signing me um, because Dan Parks left Glasgow he went down to Cardiff and and there was an opportunity uh, and yeah no I'm I'm very grateful that Sean. Uh, saw the faith in me, um, oh. so I went. I went a full season at Hawks uh, after my knee, and then I'd done a twenties year that year, and then my first pro season, and then I come against your uh, beetroot face in <laughs> Italy, sunburnt as hell, and honestly, my body was. I remember like I couldn't train. Like, obviously, the 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 IRB. Um, under twenties, it's like it's five mental. games in the space. It's like stupid how many games for young boys. Absolutely mental. Um, and I remember, like after game two, I couldn't train. So like game one, I've got, I've still got a scar from the, <laughs> the big South African number eight. Couldn't train after that. Like, mate, that's you in the week. I don't see you till Thursday. <laughs> I come on you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, it, um, it all really happened quite fast. Um, and I, I just had that determination like uh, I remember training more football back in the day and it must have been 12 or 13 and and just a flick went in my head and I remember Mm -hmm. training it was like just a fitness drill it wasn't like anything technical with the ball or anything and I seen boys like jogging about and not taking it that um kind of half arsed and I just remember then I'm 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 going to train full out I'm going to give it my best crack of the whip and uh from then on um uh, yeah, I, I just had a hunger to to be successful in sport. Um, it was always a a great avenue of of um, of just enjoying myself when I was young, from a young age. So um, yeah, no, I was very fortunate that the opportunity came at, at, up at Glasgow when Parksy left, and I managed to go in there and and have a reasonable reasonable start to my pro professional rugby career. Yeah, so I mean, the, the Glasgow opportunity and the time you spent there, we're going to cover next. I think it's important to touch base on your, your early years, though, because you were massively, in, you're massively into your football, a huge Rangers supporter. Um, surely there was a point at which, or were you not good enough to try and pursue that career in football? Because I know you played at a decent underage level. Um, yeah. At what point did you have to make that decision? And, <laughs> you know, why didn't you pick the football, mate? <laughs> I know, I know. My spine tells me that every day. Um, <laughs> After an 80 minutes performance and tackling boys twice my size, um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think um, 
So I've done a, the rounds of a few um, SPL clubs and their youth setups, and um, I finished off my last year was at Celtic, and I signed a two-year deal. Um, albeit my my grandpa grew up in Govan in the shipyard, so he gave me Rangers boxer shorts to wear underneath my Celtic kit <laughs> yeah. until they washed out. True story, literally. Yeah. He, it was a Rangers Rangers pair of tartan uh, boxers, I remember. <laughs> and um, and I, I had signed a two-year sorry, and this was when I was. Uh, under 15 um, but at, the, at that stage the following year you jump up to under 17s at football for some reason and everyone you could leave school at 16 so there was boys like full time and I had to be competing against them and I was like I don't know if I I don't know I just I, I didn't I didn't enjoy it the way I should have enjoyed it like um, we had a, a new um, coach that was his Biggest gig at the time to get this Celtic job in the under uh, 15s, and he put, to be fair, a lot of pressure on us as young boys. And I remember just not enjoying it the same mm. as um, I was previously at Kilmarnock and uh, had little stints uh, uh, with other clubs, but I really enjoyed my time at Kilmarnock. Um, we had a great bunch of guys, a great, great um, coaching staff, and we, we did actually, we punched above our weight. We had a, a lot of good footballers that went on and had uh, good careers at that club. Um, and I remember like playing for Celtic was amazing. It was amazing having that um, title um, of, of being uh, a member of one of the biggest teams in, in Scotland. But yeah, no, it, it just came came at a point that I just was I, I didn't enjoy it the same way as what I had done uh, in previous years. And I thought if I'm going to give rugby a shot, then this is the like my last years of of doing it. And um, a lot of kind of district pathway stuff kicks off at under sixteen level, and yeah, um, it gets very remember, serious, doesn't it? I remember um, I used to take um, there used to be a school trial and then a club trial, and I used to take the afternoon off school for the school trial, <laughs> for, like from S one all the way up to, and I think this was like S four at the time, under sixteens maybe. And I remember turning up to this trial, and all the the scouts came over and were like, "No, you always come, you always get selected, we always rant and rave." But you t- you take the afternoon off school, you car <laughs> you do well in the game, and you never come back. So no, you're not even playing the day. And I was like, <laughs> I'm genuinely being serious. I'm 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 here, and I'm going to play rugby this year. And they're like, Nah, you're just here for the afternoon off school. <laughs> and to be fair, I probably would have just jinxed my way in and 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 called a bluff. But to be fair, um, yeah, no, I played that day, and yeah, I managed to to go through all the the pathway stuff and um. I represented Scotland under 17s uh, against Wales. First game was down in Millfield in the in the School Cup, and yeah, um, it started it started from there. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, the context is is really clear that there's a decision made at, at that point that rugby is going to be your future and your attempted career, and I think. <laughs> You know, we, you, you kind of skip forward all those years. I can see it in you now, even when you train, even when I watch the game at the weekend against Italy, like your your effort and energy levels are always so high. And obviously when that, that flick switch, when that flick, that's, that switch flicked, yeah. when that switch flicked, you obviously, you know, decided that you were going to be doing everything at 100% of your effort. There was no slacking and no time wasting. And that's very evident from someone who trains with you on a daily basis. I mean, you skip forward to, to that introduction into the Glasgow team and at such a young age and having, I mean, in your first season, I think you were second uh, point scorer in the Pro 14 or whatever the equivalent, the Pro 12 at the time, I think mm-hmm. it was. I mean, you, you've come on to the, the, the club season with a massive bang. Um, those years at Glasgow, being a Glasgow boy, must be very, very special to you. Um, can you reflect on them? And I have this image of you dandering around the West End, thinking you're Billy Big Bulls. Is that is that fair enough? Um, I was definitely not in the West End at that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was um, yeah, it was something that you're just kind of like you played for your local team at Ulster. Like, yeah, you kind of have to p- pinch yourself at times. Like, I went from being a mini rugby player, playing at half time on the pitch, to then going and watching, to then getting the chance to play um, and I remember the first couple of appearances and just kind of pinching yourself you know, like, oh I'm, I'm here I'm here so um, getting those um, first couple of caps under your belt it just 
makes you realize how much you want it uh and that like that 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 button uh the the flick of the the switch is is firmly cemented down you've got the cell tape over it and you're, you're not <laughs> taking it off um yeah it's on autopilot from now on and um yeah it's um at that stage of my career if you had told me that i would have two years at glasgow and and that would be it i'd, I'd have been more than happy with that like um i definitely um was was just living the uh, my dream at that stage. I didn't see it as work. I didn't see it as a job. I I just seen it as as a, as a young boy playing rugby and 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 just in the in the best place possible, doing that for your local professional side. Yeah, and I think whilst you're doing that, you're kind of you're starting to not as you move through the years at Glasgow, you're starting to notch up these Scotland caps, and then there becomes this this kind of key swivel point within your career where i'm keen to discuss the 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 move that takes you from glasgow to edinburgh now there's only two professional rugby teams in scotland now you know, with the borders being taken out and um whatever and you could actually argue that there's definitely a need for another scottish professional team to be to be in there i don't know what your mm-hmm. thoughts are on that we'll get to that after but that that moment in which the conversation starts that you're saying you know Maybe you need to go and look at him more regularly at Edinburgh. How how does that feel? How do you take that in the chin? And and what were your intentions when you were on your way to Edinburgh? Um, uh, I was broken hearted. Um, so I managed. I always had great competition at Glasgow. So I'm. I, I don't mind saying it because I'm good mates with everyone that I've played alongside. So Rudy Jackson's one of my closest friends. Mm. So me and him were battling it. Yeah, bat on away for say four years or so, and I managed to tip him, uh, and I got signed, and he got released. Uh, or well, he, it wasn't a, a deal for him, and he, he had to look elsewhere. Yeah. And then Finn comes comes along, and, and Finn's horizontal. Um, and I at that stage I was probably um, I spoke last week in the press about it. Like I was probably a wee bit too intense. Like I like I needed perfection perfection in my preparation perfection during the game like I needed everything to go by the 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 kind of the finest little bullet point and the the full stop and all, like everything had to be perfect um yeah. and that was probably one of my downfalls at early rugby um I, I couldn't get over mistakes I couldn't really bounce back for things the same way and then I look at Finn and he's he's juggling tennis balls over in the corner or he's he's laughing and, and do you know what I mean? Like it was just the polar opposite and 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 it took me a while to get over um of uh, to get over that to be fair. Um Finn coming in and, and taking my place at Glasgow like um I'd I'd be sitting on the bench and getting fifteen, twenty minutes here and there and, and I'd be looking to pull a rabbit out of the hat every week and I'd just be shooting myself in the foot um time and time again and it came um it came literally really early on uh, the, the conversations with Edinburgh and um, albeit I had a few conversations with other clubs at the time as well but uh, Scott Johnson the director of, of rugby at, the, at Scottish rugby at the time he said oh what would you feel about coming across and, and being the starter here at Edinburgh <laughs> and my first reaction was fuck off no <laughs> honestly I said that to him like face to face I was like nah I'm, Glasgow, like, I'm Glasgow like and like the 1872 cup, the the derby up there was big at this stage. Yeah, like it, was, it still is. Yeah, it was a feisty affair. Like mm. there was fights most games, and like it was big big games around the festive period. Um, it's a bit <laughs> like to be fair, it was it's a bit different now. Like the guys know each other so well and all the rest. Of oh, it. Okay. But, um, like the this is still heated, but it's just not the same way as as what I first remember it. It's more heated um, in relation to competition for places for Scotland rather than yeah, this kind probably. of t- territorial. Yeah, because yeah. Glasgow and Edinburgh, like, you, they, they don't like each other. It's just one of these things. It's just <laughs> you don't need like, to explain that to me, mate. You know I'm from Northern Ireland, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, no. Um, when he first mentioned it to me, I, I literally told him to fuck off in his face. No, that's never happening. And then it slowly kind of digested. I was like, actually, look this could be a really good move for my career um uh, and we started to move things along and and um i remember um so i, I didn't play i think i don't know if i wasn't selected or i was injured for the first 1872 game but i started mm. the following week in edinburgh 
and I'd already signed that week. Like it, it happened really That's quickly. Weird. Like, and I didn't know. Like it was weird because some of the Edinburgh boys, like, kind of knew. Like they were like yeah. at the end of the game handshakes. They were like, <laughs> and I, I like winking at me and stuff. And I'm like, how did, how did, how did, how did it? Yeah, how nothing's ever a secret, mate. Like I've told no one. Like I've maybe mm-hmm. told like close friends, and that's it. Yeah. Um. So, like, the decision was really good for my rugby career. Like, it, it took me a while to accept that and see that, and and just take away the, the pride and all the emotion that I had um, connected with Glasgow because there's there's still so much inside me. But as a pure rugby decision, uh, and and being a professional rugby player, it was the it was the right move at the the right time for me. Um. And uh, yeah, it was just a shame that um, on the rugby side, side of things, life in Edinburgh was just a bit um, prone to injuries. But to be fair, our personal lives, me and Nick, uh, my wife, we absolutely loved living in Edinburgh. We had Edinburgh the time of our amazing lives. place. Was, our, arguably the, the happiest we've ever been as a couple. Like we rekindled some amazing friendships um uh, of people that we knew from age grade rugby through there yeah. and um people that we probably hadn't spent enough time with uh and we're so so close to them like um uh, when we come up north uh any time time off we 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 pretty much split our time Glasgow and Edinburgh because we we've, yeah. we've got so um close friends up there um so it's um off the field Edinburgh we we I didn't know the city at all. I grew to love it. It was um, we we had we had an apartment in town, and uh, everything was in walking distance. And things like the Fringe Festival, which I hadn't been at before, Class. and the Christmas markets. It's it's honestly one of the most ridiculous places to live. Um, I mean, if it had a better climate, I'm I'm sure um, a lot more people uh, would be would, would choose to live in Edinburgh. I'm sure uh, from all over the world. Um, so um, on a on a personal note, me and Nick couldn't be unhappier in Edinburgh and unfortunately the rugby side of things uh, a few injuries um, uh, hiccuped my, my Edinburgh career but um, yeah. I was happy that I finished it on a high like once everything I got back fit I, I finished it on a real high and I almost um, proved to people that I could still play um, if, if anyone had doubted me uh, yeah. and then obviously uh, there I was um, coming down the, the M6 and M5 to, to Worcester yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the, that period at Edinburgh, because I, I know you personally so well, and I remember the, the time that you were sent on loan to Worcester and then you were back to Edinburgh and we'll get to that. But I think the Edinburgh period is really tough for you because we're going to get to the injuries a little bit later and how that affected, but it didn't allow you to go and you've made this massive decision to move from your boyhood club to the effectively a rival club and you haven't been able to output the product that you want to in order to, 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 to legitimize or to, um, you know, accelerate your career internationally as you wanted to, which was the main mm. reason for you moving to Edinburgh. Yeah, and that yeah. must have been deeply frustrating for you. It must have, you know, at that, at that point, are you thinking, I'm done with rugby, I just can't get my body going, or, or what was going through your head? Um, so the first season, um, I broke my jaw. Um, it was actually Solly's last game in charge of Edinburgh at the time. Mm. Uh, and it was away in Munster and I had an uncontested scrum against CJ Stander on five metres out. All the best. So I've I've flown at him and I've chucked my body in, in, uh, in front of him and he's headed my jaw and just fractured my jaw. Um, so that took me out for like two months and then I'm, I think I, man- I managed to get back fit again and I got, got selected for Scotland and I was on the bench for the, all of the Six Nations. I came on uh, to be fair, it was a, probably a, a, a big moment uh, in my Scotland career. I, I came off the bench for a HIA when Finn went off against Ireland. Yeah. And I put in a, a lovely touch finder over Simon Zebo's head, and it was a one bounce and out, like they kind of kicked it, get me going. Um, and it was it, it just that I think from that moment, that cemented my place on the bench uh, for the rest. Because I know, like, he could have went other directions and, and had other cover. So, um, just that one moment, like that kick, that one moment cemented my place in that Six Nations um, side on the bench. Anyway, for the remainder of that, and then I come off the bench at fifteen against England away from home for thirty-five minutes. 
and that's the end of that story. Uh, <laughs> and I got and I got ten minutes off the bench in the last game um, against Italy, and um, I did, nothing really. We were kind of Edinburgh was was struggling. I couldn't even get back in the Edinburgh side at times at the end of that season. Um, and then Cockers came over, uh, and I basically just pushed my body to to try and impress him. Um, I was picking up a groin niggle. Uh, it was just escalating. I was still playing. He, he said, look, you're my starter. You're my number one. Um, and I played, I think it was like the first seven or eight games of the season. And my yeah. body was just, like, I should have listened to it. Like, it was, it was so stupid of me now in hindsight. But I was just not respecting. Hindsight's twenty the, twenty though, donkey. Yeah. And I was just pushing myself. And I ended up, um, I had a, a slight tear in my, my left adductor. And I went down and seen specialists uh, in England. Um, and then I came back up and got a, a steroid injection in my pubic synthesis. Yeah. And from that, an infection grew. Uh, and it literally just wasted everything in my lower body. And, like, it Not was much to waste ones. anyway. Uh, true. Um, I, I did have a big arse before that. <laughs> Nicola, I'll tell you. Like, my arse is half the size now. The glutes. Um, and I... And, and like she, she was um she was amazing at that period of time because I'd be I lived in a puddle of sweat for two two weeks straight I think or two and a half weeks, um I'd wake up from a nap and I'd be like starving. She'd go and make me a cup of tea and a slice of toast, and by the time she'd done that, I'd be like passed out again. So I'd just be constantly waking up to cold toast and cold tea because she'd get fed up, <laughs> fed, fed up. I'm not making you another one. I'm not making you another one. Yeah, and um. Oh, it was, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Like, it was a, the strangest period of, of, of an injury. Like, it's not like you can't just put your finger on it. And eventually got, like, blood testing, which ended up being, like, twice a week at, um, after this. But, like, my my white blood cells or my red or whatever, the one with an infection, it was, like, it was a ridiculous amount over. It was, like, say, I don't know, five, six times the difference uh, and I went on antibiotics for like four months and slowly but surely it, it, the the count um, just came down and I, I managed to, to get back to, to some sort of, of, of healthiness and yeah. um, but it, this was a, like a, quite a stressful period of time because Cocker ha- was happy with me um, and we we pretty much um, agreed to, to stay in Edinburgh and we sold our flat. We were going to buy a, a house in South Queensbury. And for you, it's like 45 minutes to Glasgow from there or, mm-hmm. or 25, 30 minutes into the centre of Edinburgh. So it's a right perfect now. happy medium ground for yeah. for starting a family, that's, which we were kind of looking to do. And, and then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, it's off the table. Um, and then uh, that that was kind of part of the reason, reason why I was pushing to get down and, and, and to play at Worcester uh, on loan yeah. because... I knew I had no future at, at, at Edinburgh, and um, uh, you know what it's like uh, being a Celtic player going down uh, and, and playing in the Premiership and, and holding your own down there. It's uh, it stands for uh, a lot with Premiership clubs if you can hold your own down there. Um, so that was my thought process, and yeah, I was itching to come down to Worcester and get a run of games. But yeah, after a week, uh, uh, I had to um, pack up a, a transit van and, and move. <laughs> Move everything back down. I literally, uh, my car was down in Worcester. Um, I remember for like five weeks or something like that, until we yeah. played the Dragons away from home. And from the kit man, actually, we flew down, got the bus mm-hmm. from Bristol to Newport. We um, checked in at the hotel, had dinner, and then the kit man drove me to Worcester. I picked up my car, went back. The team manager drove it to the game, and then post game, uh, I came off the bench. Um, that night, and then after the game, I drove from there to Glasgow, and then the following day, I had my niece's um, birthday party. The following day, and I'm an absolute zombie getting in at like half three in the morning. But and your spine, oh, and you're, you're back yeah, absolutely in bits. But I think you know before we move on to the Worcester experience, because it's been it's been hugely beneficial for you because you've stayed injury free, touch wood, and you've played some really good rugby, smashed a load of points uh, for us, and, and reignited your Scotland career. But I'm keen to just discuss that. The intensity that you talk about when you were at Glasgow tying in with the potential for you to be overtraining 
um, and pushing your body in desperation to be performing, you've pushed your body to the place where it's kind of starting to give up on you. You know, it, it, have you learned lessons from those periods where your your intensities caused you to overtrain? Um, because I now see you've got you've got a really kind of slick and smooth routine in terms of how you goal kick, how you do your little extras and stuff. But you've had to develop that over time. Yeah, no, it's probably. I came away from that the the whole episode at Edinburgh with just like respect the little niggles. Because if you don't, then they just kind of domino effect up and it just becomes a bigger problem and a bigger problem. And then yeah. all of a sudden you're out for a period of time and instead of just kind of listen to your body. Like, um, And now I, I've, I've got my own routine. Um, I know Johan just lets me do my own thing half the time in the gym because it's, I, just, I just know what kind of works for yeah. what I need to get done. Uh, and it's not a, a case of me being lazy and just wanting to do my own stuff in the gym. No, you've and, got your you've got your stuff um, that you know can get so you to yeah. a position where you need to perform. So exactly. Um, so yeah, no, I've just kind of stuck by that ever since. And yeah, no, I've I've um, I've actually my body's been in good shape since I've I've moved into Worcester. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that was probably the biggest learning from that episode. Albeit, again, I was so keen to. To obviously cockers as a uh, an, a kind of alpha male, like very dominant um, character leader, uh, and I wanted to rise to that challenge and prove them that my worst type thing, and, and ultimately I, I probably paid the the the, <laughs> the sacrifice of that of of trying to do too much and, and not really listen to my body. Yeah, well, I think you learn these things, and like I said, hindsight's twenty twenty. But you develop the ability to to put them to place these procedures, these 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 um, routines that get you to playing good rugby. And there's no doubt about it. That move to Worcester, mate. Like it's been, you know, I was doing some research here, and like you're sitting third overall point scorer um, in the Premiership for Worcester of all time. And I think whilst Worcester have been relatively newly promoted um, into the professional era through, through the work that Cecil did, as we discussed earlier, I think like you're sitting, you're only sitting 20 points away from Andy Good, who is hailed as like one of the best you have done it for Worcester. And you're, and you know, depending on what happens in, in future contracts, you're certainly within touching distance of going on to be the top point scorer um, that Worcester's ever had, which is testament to the rugby you've played and the faith that Solly's put in you to go and back you uh, regularly and give you that game time that you've so desired to get yourself back into that international game. So would you have to, would you consider that on the whole, the move to Worcester has been a successful one on and off the pitch? Yeah, no, massively. Um, to be honest, I didn't really know <laughs> what I was, I was coming to. I didn't really um, know too much about the club and, and the history of the place but um, yeah once I stepped through the door and I seen uh, obviously firstly the the facility I was like oh goodness it's yeah I've I've found a good spot here I can I I feel like I can develop and and, and make sure I'm athletically uh, in in a great place and then obviously um, rugby can can hopefully take care of itself and I probably um just tried to enjoy myself when I when I came down as well. Um, again, taking the learnings from from the, those early uh, twenty years that of getting kind of uh, pushed for place and all the rest of it. Like, just I feel like I play my my best rugby when I'm relaxed and I'm enjoying it. Um, and that's not taken away from my preparation side and leading the team and all the rest of it, all that nonsense that comes uh, under that. But literally just on the field, just trying to enjoy it a wee bit more and not getting hung up on things, um, which is hard at times, obviously, being a, 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 a driven person to win and, and, and compete, but um, ultimately, um, yeah, just relaxing a wee bit um, has yeah. is, is, is probably been the main focus point and, and probably the most successful one mentally anyway, to get, a, to get the performance. Absolutely, and I think, you know, do you feel like, on reflection, you know, we all go through uh, we all go through periods in our lives where resilience is really important. Um, I can relate to that a huge amount. In terms of what you had to battle through, moving away from Glasgow and being told to go to Edinburgh, your initial reaction, and then finally getting your head around that that period being ruined and blighted through injury and potentially overtraining with the intent to produce the goods, and then you move to Worcester and, and someone backs you, you, you bang out you know four hundred and thirty points in all competitions. 
top quality performances that that drag a team who are, who have always been desperate for a, an out and out um, first of all an out and out goal kicker. I've been here seven years. I can say that. And then there's this opportunity to go back into Scotland camp. Have you have you given yourself a chance to reflect on it, or are you very much just staying in the moment because process produces a good outcome? Um, or have you had a moment where you're sitting with Nick and the two kids going like? Like all the hard work, all the sacrifice, all the trips up and down the M5 where your spine's compressing, it, it's 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 been worth it, and you can give yourself a small tap on the shoulder. Yeah, I mean, uh, I got a big release um, on that France uh, cap, even though it was um, for two minutes um, before the the shutdown of um, coronavirus hit. Um, yeah, those two minute minutes meant the world to me, like. Getting Emily on the pitch and doing a lap. I was just going to say with, the, with, the wee, uh, with my daughter. It was just the the best. There's a great ever. picture of that, Dunkey. There's um, one. I'm sure you've seen it, but the picture of you mm-hmm. and Emily on the pitch afterwards, like someone who's a good yeah. mate of yours. Like I was just bursting with pride because I could, yeah. you, I knew how much it meant to you. And I knew, like even just now, like I'm fully aware that Finn obviously had his episode uh, Six Nations that gave me a a chance to 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 step into the squad and. Um, it felt different coming into camp this time because I was here from the start. Um, mm-hmm. Gregor was happy with me. He's um, he's been really happy with what I'm I'm doing at Worcester. So I felt almost more involved now. It didn't take someone to to do something for me to get called in and 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 maybe run the the opposition plays for that week and then maybe hoping for a chance to come. Um, yeah. it, it did feel different, and I know I'm very for well. Oh, it's I've actually um, been given the, the license to 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 start at the weekend because Finn unfortunately uh, got injured and, and so did Adam, um, who both are fantastic rugby players and yeah, um, they, they've done such a great job for Scotland over the years. But um, I definitely felt a massive release on that that French day. Like it, it gave me a lot of motivations to. To go out and train during lockdown, like the last time I just kept telling tell myself, the last time I laced up my boots was for Scotland at Murrayfield. Like I want to do that again. Like I'm driven yeah. to do that again. Like that was an amazing day. And people might look if you get these um, keyboard warriors and be like, "Ah, oh, <laughs> got two minutes off the bench." But honestly, that those two minutes felt just as good as my first gap or. Yeah. The drop goal in Italy, or the kick in the, the winning penalty in Argentina away from home for a for a test. Go on, like, keep 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 rolling them off, mate. There's there's a couple you know, of them. But like those are like massive highs that any other yeah. person would be like, oh, that, that I can tell you, like I could tell you what your high was for Scotland. But when I say two minutes against off the bench, like it was a it was a long three three years. Um, it's wait, vindication and, for all the work that you had to do and the sacrifice. That, that that's yeah. my point. You know, uh, the to resilience. I'd, I'd do it all again for the, for those two minutes. I'd honestly, I, I said that straight after. I was, I'd, I'd have done it all again because it's such an amazing feeling having your your friends and family like uh, at Murrayfield when you're when you're on that pitch. Like, there's no there's no feeling that comes close to it. Um, yeah. And that day we won as well, which was great. Um, two minutes on the pitch and one turnover, so I was happy with that. <laughs> no big deal. The no. jackal and ten. Um, so uh, I suppose, go ahead. No, I, I, I was just joking. I was they done like a Six Nation Defender of the the um, <laughs> tournament award, and I went out to the defence coach and I was like, "You remember all those two minutes? Like that ratio of one turnover and two minutes. That, that's pretty good." Like, do I have a chance of winning? Just like, <laughs> t- obviously, just taking the piss, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to get a chuckle. But yeah, no, that just jumped in my head when when she uh, mentioned that. Yeah. I think um, so. You move to the the current day, and obviously, we're we're only you know four or five days post the the Italy game, and you get your first start in a long time. And like it's a it's I've watched the game um a couple of times and it's physical game. So haven't had a chance to break down and review that and getting your first start and performance denied a try as well. How do you how do you reflect on that as a whole? It was a tough old game. I early did um make it hard for us to, to get any rhythm into the game. Um especially that first half, like um mm-hmm. obviously they were so physical around the breakdown, but our set piece didn't really function uh, as best as it could do. And obviously, a few rest decisions going against their way, and it just became 
the Italians just having a lot of momentum. But to be fair, we we always um we always knew that they were they were going to be a, a tough opponent. Um, I think um Gregor showed a screenshot of their scores like with twenty minutes to go in their last three games, and they're like one score games. Like yeah. they are a nitty gritty side, and uh, we knew it was going to take a lot of patience um, and kind of a, a lot of effort to to get the job done. And yeah, that second half performance was was um, was was great that we got things clicking, albeit it wasn't our, our best performance, um, and we're still looking to improve. Um, but it was it was just great to to um, find a way to win in a Scotland jersey where when quite easily in the past um, those games might might have slipped past us and. Um, no, it's five wins on the bounce uh, for the squad. So uh, boys are in a, in a good place. Yeah, so it's like I mean, we can we can take a little bit of time to delve into this a little bit more because your job out half, like your job, is based around um, manufacturing opportunities to go and win games, even whenever momentum's against you. And I think the game against Italy seemed like the perfect example of a game where like it could easily get away with you because things just aren't going right for you, aren't going right for you. And then your job as an out half is um, obviously to kick points and stuff, but it's to, to try and shift that momentum. So your set piece, your scrum is is being dismantled at times. Um, you're you're struggling to, to keep your own ball. Like you said, there's a few referees' decisions around the breakdown um, with interpretation in the Six Nations. That's always the case. How do you go about on that pitch problem solving to get that momentum in your favour, knowing that in the set, tail end of the second half, you don't need to panic, you can, you can, you'll get the turn of the tide? Yeah, our messages were pretty clear. Just stay patient. It's going to click. Like it's, we're going to have our our swing of momentum. Just stay, stay in the moment. Stay, um, stay present, and just making sure that your next job's a, a good one. Whatever action it was, or um, if it's to kick a, a kick chase off a kickoff, then you're you're getting a high speed effort. The Gregor's um, really. Uh, uh, fine tunes details in every aspect of our game. So, um, like the learnings there, like we know we know our jobs, we know our uh, um, where we need our role within the team, uh, every opportunity basically. So, um, we're really fortunate that, albeit a lot of things kind of swung against us. Um, and, I, and to be fair, I see a few boys like kind of um, not not stress and panic, but like just kind of pinch them just say look it'll come just stay yeah. in it and and to be fair we we did get um had a few words at half time and, and changed a few tactical um things in our game and and we reaped the benefits of that we we kept the ball a wee bit more um instead of playing a kick tennis kind of game and, and uh trying not to blink first in a kick tennis battle uh to then maybe running the ball back and getting into our counter attack shape and getting touches on the ball and yeah. moving the Italians around that way. Um, so we, we did change a few things at half-time that ultimately um, got us kind of uh, playing a wee bit better and, and more the, the Scottish way. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, as as your old mate Ali McCoy said on Instagram as well, you were hard done not to have a try. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a shame it went forward, but ugh, um, it could have been a... The icing on the cake on a on a successful win uh, over in Italy, but um, yeah, I'll take the win any day of the week. And if I create a try, then I'm almost just as happy as as scoring, getting on the score sheet myself. Lovely. Well, we're looking forward um, as we're running up here. Last question, just based around France this week. Obviously, um, we were talking off air. There's some some issues around the Fiji camp and some COVID testing issues um which means this this fixture is going to be even more important because there's going to be potentially one team less in the competition um, we'll see what happens with that but this game against france how what sort of things are we looking to try and implement as the scottish team um and what sort of performance are we looking to put out there i say we as if i'm well, part of it just on, on your behalf <laughs> no no quite right Why not? we um, um <laughs> I think um, I think the the French team are going to come over here uh, with a, a real purpose to win. Um, they've won one test. They've lost one test match since the World Cup, and it was um, it was at Scotland uh, at Murrayfield um, just yeah. before lockdown. So um, we know they're going to come with full intentions to 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 kind of 
come physically dominate us because they're, they're, they're a huge um, pack and they've got such powerful um, players in the back line as well. So, um, albeit the weather up here today is absolutely disgusting. So that might take a, a fair bit of, um, to do with the, the how much rugby is going to be played next, um, yeah. on Sunday. But, um, yeah, I think for us, um, we need to to take confidence from that, that win. Uh, look at what we we were successful at that day. I know I know they'll they'll probably take that defeat and and look at the red card in the first half and say that's got a lot to do with it. But um, to be fair, we were looking to this morning um, that how we won that game and, and what we done. And, and yeah, you know, like I say, Gregor's really good at the small little details that help you um, piece everything together, uh, especially as a ten. Obviously, him being a ten in the past and. Uh, collectively as a group, we've got a really good coaching team. So, um, yeah, no, I'm, uh, uh, I think Scotland will put in a good show. Um, whoever goes out there and, and takes the field Sunday, but yeah, it's um, it's really exciting that, like you say, we've got potentially um, a, a semi-final to to potentially a final. Uh, the, uh, well, in a couple of weeks' time, if if Fiji don't recover from the the positive cases. Yeah, well, I think, listen, mate, I think everyone down here in Worcester is backing you massively. I know there's been a huge amount of pride within the camp. Um, every time Solly lets us know what the crack is, um, every time you're you're playing, you and Koba in the Scotland camp in particular, and then obviously with Ted and Ollie in the England camp, but we're massively backing you. Um, um, selection permitting, hopefully you go out and put a, an amazing performance in. And um, I just want to say a massive thank you for jumping on with us today and having a chat. It's been very insightful, a lot of resilience, a lot of um, opportunities taken, lessons learned. And um, I think you're one of the good guys that we're glad to see getting what he, what he deserves and what he puts into it. Cheers. No, I appreciate it. Um, all the best come Saturday. Uh, I know it'll be an emotional day with the tribute to Cecil, obviously, before the game. And, and um, yeah, no, it's, it's one that I'm sadly going to be missing. but. Uh, I'll be following it closely and, and uh, yeah, no, wish the boys all the best. Legend, well, we're going to attach all relevant information um, that Donkey has out in terms of the, the hairdo and the acorn sponsorship. So all the information will be here and please donate. It's going to an amazing cause and it is massively appreciated. So cheers and thank you for listening to episode one of Wind Your Neckin'.